got a question for all y'all. You guys, uh, can you guys tell me what Stephen King, C.S. Lewis, and Gary McIntosh have in common? Anyone know? They're what? They're, they're authors. They are all authors that I like. And that is just about all that they have in common. It is. Uh, Stephen King, you know, the, in the upper right there, Stephen King writes scary books. And um, I love his stuff. Love his books. I'm, I'm, I totally get into that. And um, I, he, has this, he has this way of, you know, having this image in mind of what he wants you to see, this picture. And then he uses his words to just paint that. And it's fantastic. When I need to be entertained, I will go and find a Stephen King book. Good stuff. Now, C.S. Lewis, uh, the upper left, C.S. Lewis, he wrote books on, on what it means to be uh, a Christian. And I'll tell you what, there's nobody who inspires my faith like C.S. Lewis does. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And it is one of my all-time favorite books. I could read that book over and over and over. I never get tired of that book. C.S. Lewis feeds my spirit. You know, and then Gary McIntosh, the guy down at the bottom. You probably don't know Gary McIntosh, but he has become one of my favorite authors when it comes to church life. You know, he writes books that talk about a, a church's mission, a church's purpose, and how how God wants to use that church to impact its community. And so I, I'm loving reading Gary McIntosh because he gives me ideas on how to do like day-to-day -day church ministry church stuff, right? So three very different authors, very different authors, three authors that I really, really like. Three authors that feed me in different ways. You know? Do you guys have that? Do you find this to be true for yourself too? Not, I mean, maybe not just with books, but with life in general. Do you find that there are different people or different things that feed you in different ways? Do you find this to be true? I, I do uh, I do premarital counseling a lot for couples that are about to get married, you know. And sometimes when I'm doing um, this premarital counseling, we'll do an inventory together, where I'll I'll have them fill out um, a, a whole bunch of statements where they're going to agree or disagree with these statements, and it helps us assess the areas of their relationship that are strong and maybe those that need a little bit of work, right? And and one of the statements that they that they answer is is this one here. It says, after marriage, I expect that some of my needs will be met by other people. All right? After marriage, I expect that some of my needs will be met by people other than my spouse. And then they have to tell me how strongly they agree or disagree with that statement. And I'll tell you what, it always raises my eyebrows a bit when people strongly disagree with this statement when they strongly disagree. I mean, because you see what, what that would say if they strongly disagree with this. If they say, no, that is not true. If they, don't, if they disagree with that, what they're saying is that after they get married, they are going to be counting on their spouse to meet every need that they have. Every emotional need, physical need, mental need, spiritual need will be met by their spouse. Man, that, that, that's a lot of pressure, man. Isn't it? To expect one person to meet all that? Now, I get what they're saying. I, you know, because sometimes we do have people that disagree. And I get what they're saying. They're saying that they're, they are not going to be looking to other people for fulfillment. And I get that. But the reason that that question is being asked is to find out whether or not this person realizes that they cannot count on their spouse to meet every single need that they have. Right? Isn't that true? I mean, I, uh, there's, we've got to have different avenues in our lives for building us up. I can't count on Cindy to meet every single need that I ever have. I can't count on her for that. That's why I have other friends in my life. That's why I have other people in my life, is to meet these other needs that I have. Does that, does that make sense? You guys get that? It would be foolish of me to go to the bookshelf looking for a Stephen King book on church ministry. Right? It ain't there. It ain't there because he doesn't write that kind of stuff. He writes different things. There's other books that deal with that. But that's how it is with us. I mean, we are like that, right? We have, we have been made 
uniquely complex with different areas of our lives that get fed in different ways. Isn't that true? I mean, you know, you and I, we have a physical aspect to us. We have an, a, an emotional aspect, a mental aspect, a spiritual aspect to us. And each one of us is designed uniquely, right? We are utterly unique, which is why I would never expect that somebody else would be fed the same way that I get fed, right? I would never expect that somebody would agree with my choice of authors across the board. Except Stephen King. I, if, if you don't like Stephen King, then we, we really don't have anything to talk about. I'm just kidding. Kind of. Kind of kidding. So you and I were made w with different kind of components in our lives, right? We were, made, we were made with different components in our lives. And it's not hard to see that that's true for each one of us, right? I mean, we feed ourselves physically in a different way than we feed ourselves emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Isn't that true? You know, you know what the problem is then? The problem comes when I know that I've got these components to my life, but I forget that these components come together to form one person. You know, that's what the problem is when I start to compartmentalize my life and I forget that they all come together to form one person. And it might sound silly to say that, but I'll tell you what, we actually do this more often than you think. We actually do this pretty often. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. Um, if you've got a Bible with you, open it up with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Or if, if you've got a cell phone or tablet or whatever, want to use that. If you don't, use the blue one. There's blue Bibles in front of you um, or maroon Bibles. And if you want to use that, in the blue one, it's on page 842. And in the maroon ones, it's 1560. But we're looking at Mark 12. It's near the back of your Bible. Mark chapter 12, near the back. Mark 12, 842, 1560. Um, Christians, you know, Christians believe that, that Jesus is the embodiment of God, right? That God came to our world in a person, in Jesus. So that when Jesus speaks, it is God speaking, right? And, and sometimes people have a hard time with that because we kind of develop our own ideas of what God is like and what he wants and, and who he is. And yet when, when Jesus says something, I, I, we've got to be really careful about taking our own ideas about who God is and putting them on top of what Jesus says. We need to push that aside. And we need to listen to what Jesus says. Because again, when Jesus speaks, it is God speaking. When Jesus is telling us about God, God is telling us about himself. Okay? So let's take a look and see what Jesus says about God. And we're going to look at, it start in verse um, 28. And this is, what he, this is what he says. This is what it says. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. And he realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And the teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by, in the law. And realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. I, you know, I, I, this is a great section. This is, I mean, if you're going to bookmark a section of your Bible, bookmark this. Because in a nutshell, this is where God tells us what is most important to him of all. Okay? And it boils down to two things, doesn't it? Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is what God wants more than anything anything. And so when you look at that to say, okay, well, what, what, what does that really mean for me? It, that's, that's actually kind of a lot to deal with. That's a lot to bite off. And so what I want to do today is look at half of it. Let's just look at half. All right. Let's, maybe next week we'll look at the other half. But today I just want to look at that first half. So when Jesus is asked, hey, Jesus, what is the most important thing to God? What does God want more than anything? He says, this is what God wants. He wants you to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here's my question, you guys. 
why do you think that Jesus breaks it down like that? Why, why not just say, love God completely? Love God fully? Why not just say that? Why say, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength? Why do you think? Anybody have ideas? Why do you think he does that? Seems like he's like actually causing himself to use more words than he needs to. Okay, so you'll pay more attention to each one of them. I like that. I like that. That's a good idea. Anybody else have ideas on this? Why he breaks it down rather than just say, love God with fully. Okay, so if you don't include all those, lo the, the love could become shallow. Okay. I, I'm liking this. All right. I, 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 this might change my entire sermon. No, it doesn't. Because I think this, what, what I'm, I was thinking that along the same lines that Larry's thinking. What I'm thinking is, the reason that Jesus does that is because we tend to compartmentalize our lives. You know, we do. We tend to compartmentalize our lives. And then we sometimes forget that all of the different parts of our lives actually come together to form one person. You know, we do. We do. We feed ourselves physically differently than we feed ourselves emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And then sometimes it becomes easy for us to separate out those different parts, you know? I mean, when you think of, uh, of exercise, exercise benefits my physical self, right? It benefits me physically when I exercise, right? Does it also affect me mentally? Does it affect me emotionally? Does it affect me spiritually? It does, it does. When you exercise, it affects your whole being. But we tend to focus just on the physical aspect of it. That's what we see the primary benefit. So when God wants to relate to you, when he wants to connect to you, does he want to connect to your spiritual side? Your emotional side? Your mental side? Your physical side? Yes, all of them, right? I mean, clearly, God is not interested in just addressing one little part of your life. He wants to love all of you. All of the above. And you know what else he wants? He wants you to love him with all of those areas too. Okay? Now, correct me if you think I'm wrong here. But my thinking is that, that when Jesus breaks it down into love the Lord of God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, what he's saying is that when it comes to loving God, we should not and, and even we cannot compartmentalize that love. You cannot compartmentalize it. You cannot love God intellectually with your mind, but not love him with your heart emotionally. You can't do that. You can't love God with your soul spiritually, but not love him with your strength physically. Does that make sense? Do you guys agree that that's what he's saying here? When he says love the God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you can't love God with part, but not with another part. You know, um, in the Bible, John, John says this a little more bluntly than I'm saying it today. This is in, in 1 John 4, this is what he says. He says, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? I mean, and you get what he's, you get what he's saying there? I can't love God with my lips, but not with my heart. I can't do that. I cannot love God with one aspect of my life, but try to opt out another part. I can't do that. That's that's like, that's pretend love, isn't it? That's like I'm, it's like I'm trying to appease God. I'm trying to, trying to throw him a bone. You know, here, take this little part of love, but I'm going to withhold this other part. And, and I don't think God's very interested in that. You know, I, God, doesn't, God doesn't want your mind. He wants you. He doesn't want your heart. He wants you. He doesn't want your body, your spirit. He wants you. Does this, does this make sense, why, I think, why Jesus is saying this? So, I, I guess what I want to do is I want to take a little pressure off you. And I want to remind you that none of us do this very well. Okay? I will admit I'm, I'm terrible at this. I am. I find that I'm pretty good at loving God with certain aspects of my life, but I really struggle in other areas. I do. I'm, I'm, good at, I'm good at talking about my love for God. I'm good at that. And I, I guarantee you, you will never find a Sunday when I am not in church worshiping God 
somewhere, even when I'm on vacation. You know, I am in church worshiping God because I'm good at loving God with my soul, with my spirit. But like John talks about here, I'll tell you what, there are times when I allow frustration that someone else has caused me. I'm not going to name names here today, but um, frustration that someone has caused me to kind of like sit within me, you know, and I, I start to let it percolate in my mind. And before I know it, I'm, I'm, I'm planning out that person's untimely demise in my mind, you know. Not to that extreme, of course, but you get what I'm saying, right? It's easy for me to love God with part of me, but I struggle loving God with other areas of my life, you know? I mean, do, do you find this to be true for you? Do you find this to be true? I, this is, I don't think this is uncommon at all. Maybe you have an easy time loving God with your strength, that we're, you're serving at the rescue mission, or you find ways to do good things for people, you're staying busy, but maybe you struggle loving God with your soul, spiritually, making worship a priority. Or maybe you struggle loving God with your mind and, and reading his word. Or maybe you struggle loving God with your heart, feeding compassion for hurting people and lost people. None of us are, are really good at doing all of this. None of us are really good at it. But, but here's the thing, right? If this is the most important thing to God, God says, right? He says, this is the most important thing if this is the most important thing, to love God with everything you have and everything you are, the question is, are you trying to get better at it? Or have you become content loving God with one area of your life? All right, if this is the most important thing, are we trying to grow in those areas that we struggle? Or are we just hoping that God is satisfied with the love that we're giving him in certain areas? And, and so my hope today is that, is that we, we are seeking some balance with this. I don't want anyone here to feel guilty about the areas that we struggle, but I don't want anyone here to feel content either. <laughs> you know, I mean, a, a disciple is someone who is always growing, always learning, always seeking God. It's a process. So as you leave here today, my, what I really hope that you're asking yourself is how could I love God in a way that I'm not currently using. When Jesus says to love God with all of your strength, what, what do you think he means by that? You don't have to answer it. I want you to answer it for you. What does it look like for you to love God with your strength? When, when Jesus says, love God with your mind, what does that mean? What does it mean for me to love God intellectually? What does it mean for me to love God with my heart, with my emotions. What does that mean? And how can I love God with my spirit, my soul, in a different way than I'm doing now? And, you know, I, again, I don't want anyone to feel pressure. Our goal is not to look at all these and to, okay, at the end of the week, I'm going to give myself an A-plus in all of them. You know, that's not the goal. The goal is to find one area where we tend to struggle and find one new way to love God this week. That's the goal. You know, don't, don't set yourself up for failure. Find one way that you can love God this week. Because the truth is, that, that none of us here, there's not a single one of us here that is going to be able to love God with everything we have and everything we are until the day when we meet him face to face in paradise. That's the, that is the only time we're going to be able to love God fully and completely. But you know what? We sure can try to do better at it in the meantime. I'm going to invite you to pray with me as our ushers come up this morning. God Almighty, you gave us all of yourself in Jesus. And we want to give you all of ourselves too. We confess that it's much harder to do that than it sounds, so we ask for help. Help us this week to identify areas that we try to withhold and show us how we can love you more completely with our lives. Father, as we give our offerings to you this morning and our tithes, we also give you our hearts and our souls and our minds and our bodies as well. And we ask that you would use us in the way that you know is best. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.